And welcome to those that are joining us for this week's YP Speaks. Um, so today marks May 14th, 2015. Uh, this is the second part of our mini-series on pain and palliative care. For those that um, are new to you, our Why Speak sessions, uh, this is our Young Professionals Chronic Disease Network bi-weekly live hangout. So we have a community that's filled with an amazing amount of talent and expertise in various NCD areas and related fields, and we try to allow and create a platform for them to share, for ideas to be exchanged and um, partnerships to be made. So this week, we have Dr. C or Christian Nizamira, oh my goodness, I practiced, <laughs> Nizamira. It's funny, because we are um, comparing the difference between me and T in his native tongue. So Dr. Christian uh, is the head of palliative care services and former director of the Kabadjia um, director or district hospital in Kilaji. Christian, I feel like you should take over for all of these um, oh, hey. all you of these names. <laughs> <laughs> so he is a palliative care expert and educate, educator, pioneering integration of end of life care into health services rendered into Rwandan patients who are living with chronic illnesses and acute care in community settings. Um, so this is kind of a, a, a micro view from what we established uh, starting our series last week. So we had fellow YP here, uh, Afsen, join us, pro providing a beautiful platform to move forward um, in speaking to pain and uh, palliative care uh, just in the life continuum. So discussing pain divide, features of justice, both respect for individual as well as responsiveness of health healthcare systems. And then um, Christian will be leading us through, I guess, a more finite and, and country-specific example uh, for our, our closing uh, session. So Christian, I will pass the, the figurative uh, microphone over to you. Um, please feel free to highlight uh, any pieces that I missed. You have a long accomplished uh, bio sketch and um, I know that you're uh, currently traveling for other pursuits for, for work, so please feel free to highlight um, as you see fit, and I'll welcome you on behalf of our uh, YP community. Um, thank you, uh, Desiree. Uh, I, I hope I pronounce well Desiree <laughs> uh, <laughs> for, for the invitation, and uh, it's, a, it's a really great pleasure for me, and uh, it's an honor to be here and share uh, our, our small experiences of palliative care and pain management um, in Rwanda. So I'm going really to share the experiences from Kibagabaga Hospital because it's the hospital um, I work and uh, <coughs> was the, the first hospital in Rwanda uh, where we really accomplished and integrate palliative care and pain management uh, uh, in Kigali. So. It's uh, really a privilege to just share my experiences, and I'm really um, happy, uh, especially from developing country, because people uh, think that nothing could be done in, from developing country. We have so many experiences also to share, and uh, to be here for this platform and, and discuss about that, so it's a really uh, a great privilege. So I'm going to... I hope uh, it will work about my presentation. Okay. So is it work? Um, I'm going to uh, talk about the integration of uh, uh, in just uh, 15 minutes integration of uh, palliative care uh, in, in Rwanda, uh, a global AKT experiences uh, from Kibagabaga Hospital. Uh, for those who don't know about Rwanda, you know, Rwanda is um, a small beautiful country in the heart of Africa. So for those who want to test one of the best coffee, please uh, you are welcome uh, in Rwanda, and if you want to see also a gorilla in life, so welcome in Rwanda. It's a country called uh, thousand, a country of thousand hills. 
the population is 11 million, and 84% uh, of our population live in, in, in the countryside, in the rural area. And um, as you can see, the GNP, GNAI uh, per capita um, from uh, since 1994 uh, moved from 160 uh, US dollar to 570 US dollar. So there is a really, really a, a lot of improvement uh, being done after the genocide. So the physician ratio, according to the, the World Bank, it's uh, um, one physician for uh, 20,000 uh, people. Uh, we can't talk uh, about palliative care in Rwanda without share um, uh, the context of uh, uh, where we come from. So this year uh, is the 21st uh, um, uh, year of uh, commemoration uh, post-genocide again to see up in 1994. So during the genocide, uh, one million people have been killed uh, during 100 days. That means 10,000 people uh, per day. And more than two million refugees out of the country. So you can imagine the PTSD, the post-traumatic syndrome disorder um, in Rwanda society is, is really huge and the mental health uh, a huge issue. So I've been inspired all, all the time inspired by our president and, and during the commemoration this year uh, in last April uh, he said something really touched me and especially as I work in palliative care it's uh, he was really significant and it was really a echo in my mind. Uh, it said we remember to uh, restore dignity to those who have been killed, but also to those who are living. So working in palliative care, I can really understand uh, behind what the, uh, the president say uh, during the commemoration, but especially for those patients um, who really need the palliative care. Uh, I would like just in brief um, give some improvement have been done uh, in Rwanda since 1994 before talking about palliative care uh, properly. As you can see, so many improvements have been done in health indicators, uh, like example maternal mortality in Rwanda. You can see in 1994, after just after genocide, so the, the maternal death per 100,000 was really huge. And if you can see now in 2010 how um, uh, the indicators drop and uh, how the Ministry of Health and the government of Rwanda uh, want to tag, uh, want to achieve in this year uh, the MDG target, one of the MDG targets about uh, to reducing the maternal mortality in Rwanda. So it's uh, it's, it's a really huge and tremendous. Uh, uh, change have been happened since 1994. So in terms of uh, child mortality in Rwanda, so you can see, um, uh, you know, the data talk uh, more than me, uh, how huge change and the improvement have been done uh, since 1994, especially um, after the genocide when uh, all the system were down, and uh, we start building from 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 ashes, from Norway, and um, improvement have been really done, and uh, uh, the, the Rwanda government still focusing to uh, achieve the MDG target. Uh, so HIV, AIDS, and um, access to IRT, um, you can see also some data um, have been done, and um, uh, low improvement uh, for our patient with HIV uh, AIDS. So the prevalence in 1994 was more than 10 percent, which is really reduced to 3 percent now. So there is uh, a lot of a lot of improvement, and uh, we can be really happy and proud uh, of our government for the lot of effort have been uh, put in health and to improve the. When we talk about uh, improvement of quality of life in palliative care, uh, it's, uh, uh, we, we, we think we start by improving the quality of life before, by prevention, before uh, uh, 
uh, get to the terminal illnesses. Is. So, uh, but even if we have also patients who already have a uh, incurable disease diagnosed, so there is always something to do. And uh, you can see for the HIV epidemic in Rwanda, between 1994 and 2012, and the access to the IRT, how uh, it was uh, really um, uh, changed the old concept of, uh, uh, of treatment and uh, health uh, in Rwanda. Uh, one of the, 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 the picture, the figure I like, it's uh, this one about the life expectancy in Rwanda. And you can see uh, after the genocide, um, the life expectancy was 28%. Um, so you can imagine people was really, uh, the, the, the delay of um, the life expectancy in that time was really, uh, I can say it's, um, it's really impossible to even have a plan and, and expect something in the future. Uh, because uh, um, because of the situation, because of the tragedy and uh, the consequence of the tragedy after the, the genocide. But now you can see how much improvement has been done because, you know, it's not only in health, but it's in an economic way. So because as health, the health, it's, uh, uh, it's a really a sector um, among the multi-sectors have been improved in in, in Rwanda, so that makes uh, uh, the, the uh, you can see the uh, the indicators, and you can see the reflect the mirror of uh, that improvement for the the, the population ages and how that's changed um, since 1994 to uh, 2012, which is now more than 60, 60, 62, 65 years uh, uh, in Rwanda. About uh, health infrastructures, you can see uh, for different program um, in 2000 how uh, some program was really integrated and in, adjusted the third level, the teaching hospital or referral center. And um, for at the district health center and the community, nothing uh, was really starting uh, uh, because of uh, the challenges, budget challenges, and uh, and. Uh, and the, the, the people on the ground, so it was only six years after the genocide, so, uh, but you can see now in 2010 how different programs have been really integrated in the community, and uh, in 2015, we hope uh, that at the end of this year, um, uh, not all, all the programs has, has been well integrated, but we hope also uh, the integration of chronic care and uh, palliative care will be also integrated not only in district or the level but also in the health center and in the community. Oh, let's talk now about palliative care in Rwanda. So, um, a small study has been done by the Pen Policy Study Group um, and also by Wimana in between 2007 and 2009, so more than 15,000 people with HIV and cancer uh, was died with moderate and severe pain. So the morphine equivalent at that time was 0 0.2 kilogram. So palliative care start, uh, the first palliative care training start in 2008 uh, when five districts have been uh, selected by the government to really integrate palliative care, and among those district hospitals, Kibagabaga uh, was among the, the, the five district hospitals selected by the government. So in 2009, so the first pediatric palliative care uh, been launched by the government, uh, the Minister of Health, um, with our uh, partner, Entraith um, Maldeme, and uh, and uh, USAID, USAID. So, and in, in 2010, between 2010 and 2011, a national policy strategic plan uh, had been uh, adopted by Rwanda. And by the way, Rwanda was the first country in 2011 uh, to adopt the national policy in palliative care strategic plan and implementation plan and guidelines approval. So, we are uh, the first country, African country, sorry, 
to uh, really launch the national policy. So we, it was a really a great achievement, uh, and especially in palliative care. So in 2012, we have a national training um, of physician and the multidisciplinary team in palliative care, what we call TOT, uh, train, uh, training of, of, of trainers. In 2013, the, we, uh, a private sector, so because we, uh, there is a strong partnership between public and private, so one the one private uh, sector um, was uh, the sisters from a congregation called uh, Sister of Angels, uh, was really uh, try also to be part of this great achievement done by the government of Rwanda in 2011. So then they opened the first hospice uh, called Saint Japol II at Kabuga, with 20 bands, very well and a good facility. So in 2014, just uh, last year, uh, the palliative care mandate incorporated into NCD division, and uh, we have uh, the national coordinator hire. Um, at the Ministry of uh, uh, Health level. Uh, what's the situation uh, about palliative care in, in 2008? So as I said uh, previously, morphine equivalent was around 0 0.2 kilograms. So per capita was less than 0 0.1. So you can imagine 0 0.2 kilogram is just enough to treat 27 people. So if you have a population in 2007, 2009, it was around uh, 8, uh, 9, and 10 million, you can see how uh, only two, 0 0.2 kilogram was not really enough to treat uh, 27 people. So the coverage of death in pain with treatment was 0 0.2 percent. So according to uh, the pen policy study group, so Rwanda need approximately uh, every year 97 kilogram of morphine um, um, just to treat all the, uh, the, the the patient and with moderate and severe pain. So the estimation of patient um, suffer from pain was really uh, huge, even above 85 percent. So this is Kibagabaga Hospital. Um, uh, the Kibagabaga Hospital is located at Gasabo. Uh, district and the Gasabo district is among the three districts we have in Kigali. Uh, we have a Gichukiro district, we have Nyarugenge district, and we have a Gasabo district. And the Gasabo district is the biggest district in Kigali city. So the catchment area of Kibagabaga is 60 percent of total population of Kigali. So Kibagabaga provides 17 health center plus one prison, 18 post health center, four. 181 villages. So we have also 100, uh, 1,467 community health workers, what we call volunteers. And uh, the hospital use 85% of public uh, insurance, what we call uh, mutual de santé, and 15% is really used by private insurance uh, in the hospital. So how was the situation uh, before we introduced uh, palliative care, before we've been selected by the, uh, the government to introduce uh, uh, and, uh, the, the, the concept of palliative care in Kibagabaga? So we have a huge number of cancer patients suffer from pain in the hospital. So morphine was being just used, was less than 4%. The morphine was just used by anesthetists to, uh, for post-op and uh, uh, during the per operation, so uh, it's it's really it was really difficult to use morphine to treat for uh, for patient who has cancer and suffer from severe pain. So and the bed occupancy rate was huge, was one hundred twenty percent because uh, we, we we used to have patients who spend like one two years in the hospital because they can't move in the family. Uh, they prefer to stay this, in the family, they prefer to stay in the hospital and uh, the patient at the same time because the hospital they can get all at least uh, all access to um, to to those painkillers and the opioid, uh, I can say opioid but uh, at least strong uh, painkiller 
available in the hospital because at the community they can't get them. So the layoff of stay was was really high, six days. And the dead rate was 3%. Why? Because uh, most of them prefer to die in the hospital more than in the community. So the psychosocial support was really inexistent and um, we had patient died with moderate and severe pain was more than 18 9%. Uh, so the question was one I've been trained in palliative care and it was really quite difficult for me because I, my plan was to be one of the best sur surgeon in the country <clears throat> because after the genocide the need of surgeon and uh, in main discipline surgeon and internist and pediatrics was really huge so my target I was really focused to be one of uh, <coughs> the best surgeon but when I've been trained in palliative care so the concept um, the concept changed my life because I I remember I met one of uh, during the world round I met one a patient uh, 24 years old with a liver cancer so the patient was really really in pain in severe pain he was yelled he was crying he was scream and the family was really uh, outside of the the, the world and the most of the family came and said, please, can you help us? And I tried to get um, a petty dean, but uh, the law uh, or the guidelines for using uh, weak opioid, even strong opioid in the hospital was really strict and it was really strong. It was really difficult. So I was really wondering and questioning myself, uh, am I going to be or not to be a surgeon? So that is the question. And uh, the question was no. Now I'm... Um, I'm really shifted in palliative care. So what was the objective by integrating the palliative care? We, one was to improve the quality of life of patients and families by trying to see how drug can be available, how we can control pain and symptoms, um, and ecological counseling, spiritual support in the family. And uh, so the second objective was to reduce costs, avoid unnecessary travel for the patient to move from the community to the district because of pain, it's all, only pain. And uh, how we can increase the home-based care, how we can involve the community, how we can engage uh, the, the, the community to, to, uh, to, to manage the patient we uh, who need palliative care because palliative care is everyone's business. And the last, uh, not the least, is to increase values. A patient must die with dignity. As I said previously, during the genocide, uh, we, we lost one million people, but we lost also our, our part of humanity during the genocide. It's why I was really, really buying and I'm really convinced what the president said. We need to remember because we have to bring dignity uh, for those who die, but for those also who are still alive. But what was the barrier? The barrier was uh, opophobia or the fear of opioid. So um, most of us, uh, um, it's, it was really difficult to prescribe morphine because um, morphine for us uh, was the last resort when someone is going to die at the last stage, then we can give morphine. So we are fear to use morphine because of the side effect. And also the doctor's attitude regard pain. So most of us, we use pain as an indicator, as a monitor to, um, to show us that the patient is alive. So if we cover that pain, how can you be sure that there is no uh, other symptom will come up from the patient? So we, we prefer to keep the patient with a small pain, uh, not completely treat the pain, but small pain and we'll be sure that the pain will let us know how uh, the, the, the patient is. So the protocol also, um, um, at Kibagabaga before you can prescribe uh, morphine, uh, that time we, you need the red ink uh, plus three signatures, one the signature from the pharmacist, one signature from the anesthetist, and one for um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the physician. And just for one amp, it could be five or ten milligram per one milliliter for of morphine. So he, imagine if one of the three is not really around, or if you need more than one amp. So 
the, the protocol the guy does was really a nightmare, so it's why the accessibility of Morphine was really difficult. Um, one of the barriers is the conflict between pharmacies, uh, physician, and the anesthetist. So we, we, we didn't work as a team, so everybody wants to protect. Uh, the pharmacist was, was really not unhappy to uh, request morphine. For which reason? Anesthetist was unhappy to see physician prescribe morphine because it's their own territory. So how this guy can you know, going to use something which is on us uh, for his purpose, which is not really uh, according to the, it's not really planned for the uh, for the curriculum. It's not really uh, the role to do that. So. Uh, the conflict was, was between pharmacists uh, and physician anesthetists was one of uh, uh, also the challenge and no link in between uh, the community. So uh, even if the patient was happy to be discharged, that was the wish from most of uh, the family. So who is going to take care of the patient in the community? Who is going to follow up? The patient in the community who will become to supervise them or even to give care to the, uh, the community. So it's one of one of the barriers. So those barriers we we will have also to to think about that. And uh, and that time it was among the objective to see how we can fix those barriers, how we can change, how we can we can give opportunity to those patients to to go back at home and to be followed at home. Uh, we have to go back again in uh, in a Rwanda social context. Uh, so in Rwanda social context, when we are well, you belong to yourself. But when you are sick, you belong to your family. Uh, I've never, since I've started palliative care, I've never been contacted by the patient themselves. I'm I'm always the time contacted by the family because it's the context when we are sick. Uh, the family take now the responsibility. Uh, of 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 you of your um, uh, uh, how can I say take the responsibility of your life because uh, that not means that you are not capable to take a decision that means you are part of a social uh, a culture society you are you are not alone you are you are you are you are living in a society and uh, this is the responsibility of the society when you are not able again to fulfill your own responsibility. So that can bring us uh, some question about the patient autonomy versus culture aspect. Because now the decision from the patient is not depend by the patient itself, it depends also by the family. So you can engage or take decision uh, for the patient or ask directly the patient without consulting also the family at the same time because they they, they feel responsible more responsible to the patient than the patient himself sometimes you ask the patient a question and say please can you talk to my my, my brother can you talk to my aunt can you talk to my my, my friend so as long as you are sick as long as your 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 humanity has been affected the 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 the, the the, the society take part of and fill the gap of, of that. So uh, and uh, it's it's really interesting um, to 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 hear that context. If we we need to uh, a success a program of palliative care because when I was training palliative care, I have been training Western uh, concept. But when I try to duplicate the same, uh, it was really difficult because. I didn't consider our culture and tradition. I was really focused to implement at the same time what I've learned, the skills and knowledge. It was really good, but uh, I, I, I did so many mistakes and I, 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 I had to rethink about how I can engage the community using uh, the patient autonomy, uh, but based in our, our society. So, and when you are sick, you belong to your family. So I have to deal with the family if I need also the patient to be really a, uh, very comfortable because the, 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 uh, the quality of life of patient depends also how the family respond on that. Uh, so you think the definition of palliative care uh, from WHO 2010, palliative care is an approach that improves the quality of life of patient and family through the prevention and relief of suffering. So you can see how uh, the definition from uh, palliative care 
uh, from the WHO use all those aspects, uh, not or physical, but physical, psychological, and spiritual. But uh, as a physician, African physician, um, beyond that definition for WHO, so my concept of uh, of palliative care is 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 really rooted by the concept of Ubuntu philosophy. So in my country we say Ubuntu, but for some part of the Africa they say Ubuntu. So wherever the pronunciation or the phonetic, so it's it's the same meaning. So means I am what I am because of because who we are all, or I'm a person through other persons. So now we can understand well how the Rwanda con uh, social context about when we are sick, you belong to yourself, you belong to, to your family, is because the Ubuntu philosophy, it's really focused on that person are not part of his own society, but that person is part of a all society is part of the community, is not a data, is not a number, is not a figure, but it's a human being, part of the society, part of a community. So Ubuntu is the essence of being human. It's a speak about interconnection. So when I'm starting to uh, um, treat the patient and talk to the family, I'm part of that interconnection with the family. So if I understood well, uh, the concepts, the culture concept uh, um, of uh, Ubuntu philosophy, I can really, really understand how the quality of life of patient it's not depend by morphine only, but it depends also by understand the concept of culture issue the patient is in, among the, that society. So, so I have to uh, to rethink again and. Uh, I know we we can get many conversation and discussion about that, but I my opinion and my understanding used my based on my small experiences, um, the definition of palliative care is really really rooted as an African. I can really understand that by using the Ubuntu philosophy, how we are not alone as uh, as a person, but we are. We are, we are a person among other person which are all co connected, interconnected, and we are part of the society, and which society have also responsibility to us. So it, it took me time to really understand that and uh, to figure out how palliative care could be well implemented, but you so that uh, with respect of our tradition and, and our, our culture. So what was the intervention. So the key component, we had multidisciplinary palliative care team within facilities. Uh, as I said previously, we integrate palliative care to community level. So we train at a health center and at the community, try to uh, integrate the concept of palliative care at all level. So we structure training um, for district level uh, and health center and the community. And we strengthen also referral networks. And one of the last uh, intervention, it was to set up a family meeting uh, the next day when we admitted a patient. Uh, because we, we uh, just realized that this is one of the most important thing uh, using the Rwanda social con context, as I explained previously, and using also the Ubuntu philosophy already rooted in our mind, in our culture. So family meeting is one of uh, the most important uh, management, key management plan when, when the, the family has to be really part of, of that because the family, uh, you belong now to your family when you are sick. And uh, uh, as you can imagine, uh, when you call a family meeting uh, in Africa, it's not easy because here in uh, in Western country, it's easy because you have one or two people, three people, who is really um, identified by the patient um, because of the patient autonomy using here in in Western countries. But in in Africa, it's quite different. When you call a family meeting, uh, you, you can't expect to see one or two people. You expect to see maybe five, six, seven, sometimes fifteen 
seven, sometimes 20. I used to have a meeting with 20 people. And uh, sometimes you have to wait for the uncle. We have to travel for, uh, for a remote place. We have uh, someone who was out of the country and they have to come. So, and it's quite difficult to talk with 15 people and to have all of us about an agreement of management. So because all of us want, want to be part of the management and all of those people, because of the, they are connected about to the patient and uh, they, they are valuable, uh, the relationships they have to the patient. So all of them, uh, want, um, they need to, uh, to, 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 to be part of the management and most of them need to be part of the management. So it's quite difficult. So uh, just for me to, really put it in a really very fun way uh, just um, imagine what I call the zoo philosophy that I, I, I just imagine when I'm talking to the group of family of 15, 20 people so I, I just imagine which kind of character of, uh, of animal the, the, the group of family represents so if I and that is the best way for me uh, to reduce my stress when we talk about with 15 people and we have to convince all of them and also uh, to reduce also my stress when uh, I was thinking if um, they are not agree about any proper way to talk to the patient so the, the zoo philosophy it's about uh, which kind of character which kind of image uh, animal image I can see when I talk to the, the, the family it could be uh, if I have a cheetah um, family, I know uh, they will go so fast and for any decision, but sometimes you are not sure that the decision is really the one you're supposed to, uh, you are not really, they are really follow about the, the or they really understand um, the management of parents. If you have uh, a Jira family, we have uh, those people, I call Jira family, especially uh, family who have, um, relative abroad we have to travel from US, from UK, uh, from Australia and they come and say oh you know I, I used to work in the hospital, I used to work in, uh, I'm a nurse, you know, they, they, most of the time they are sure of, they are sure of that they know, uh, sometimes they say, that someone will say, uh, used to tell me oh you know I know your minister very well, so I was like okay, okay, so <laughs> it's quite, so I, I, I use this kind of funny image to, to see how I can manage uh, the family meeting, but definitely the, the family meeting is really part of uh, the management. So the results, 76% uh, of patients have been discharged at home because when we are uh, using the objective uh, of integrated palliative care, only 18% die in the hospital uh, because the family and they, they just decided uh, to uh, that the patient can stay uh, at the hospital and only 6% have been referred to the third level, that means teaching hospital, because sometimes it was really requested by the family. So the dead rate uh, dropped from 3 to 1.5%, uh, and the level of stay dropped also from 6 days to 3 days. The morphine has been increased for 4% to 23%. So, and we set up a palliative care network uh, from the district. Uh, we train a multidisciplinary professional team from the district level, health center, at le health center level, we, 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 we train uh, nurses and uh, the coordinator of uh, community health workers, and we train one community health worker uh, uh, um, per village. And also, uh, just I forget to mention something uh, uh, from my, uh, my funny way to manage the family. Uh, so my role when I was talking to 15, 20 percent, 20 people from the family, as as you can imagine, it's not easy. But my role is to identify who is the lion, who is the key person, who is the next to key, uh, the person from the family. So when I identify who is the lion, I call him the lion because uh, we know that the lion is the the king of of, of all animals. So we, who is the lion? Who is the chief of the family? When I identify who is the chief. So I can really discuss with that person and we can start uh, to set up a, re a really good management of the patient. 
And uh, because I know if I convince that person, I'm sure the rest of the group will follow because I can't convince 20 people at the same time because they have different understanding of, uh, of the approach. Um, and as we can see, we, we had different uh, activities and uh, uh, during uh, the, uh, the integration of the palliative care in, in, in the Kibagabaga, so we have a mentorship, a supervision, as you can see we have a, one of the mentors came and, uh, and uh, supervise and mentor us, we have a group of uh, physicians, nurses and anesthetists. Uh, we, we had the training of community work, uh, workers, one community health worker per village, uh, we have also a training at the district or and the health center level, so we, we try to, uh, to bring on board uh, people from the health center and the district uh, and have a common understanding about the concept of palliative care. And also we try to put palliative care as in our agenda. So as the World Hospice Day, so as you can see, uh, the teaching hospital, district hospital, uh, representative from the community of workers. So we, we had the time and, uh, and, and we just walk and say palliative care, Kuribo say, that means palliative care for all. Uh, or palliative care is everyone business. So we are so happy how those activity was really, really integrated uh, uh, in the, the public health system. And this is the model of palliative care district um, still research ongoing. So we would like a really, really strong uh, network uh, from the district level at the community because one of the, the best way to uh, take care of the patient is in the community because it's quite cheaper and it's cost effic effectiveness uh, and uh, it's really even easy for the family and the, the patient themselves because most of them express to be really followed at home. So by thinking about how the district level, at the health center level and the community we will create a network, a strong network when the patient at all level can find at least someone who can give orientation, can give information, can give the proper management, I think this will be really, really uh, um, great. And uh, this is uh, what the plan was, was really to, to integrate palliative care at all levels. So at each level we have a, a someone who's been trained, a focal point, who can help the, the patient and the family. So what will be the role of community health workers? We train community health workers, uh, one per village. Uh, as we can imagine, it's not easy for volunteers. We can keep all the volunteer uh, as a physician and nurse because they, uh, most of them have uh, other businesses. But well, at least we try to share with them what is we found was will be most important for us. And uh, one of the, 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 the key role we ask for uh, community of workers during the one day training we have uh, we had with them is just to be our eye and our ears in the community. We would like them to be our ears and our eyes so, so we would like them to to just they can hear from the president what they can see uh, like in terms of like pen assessment to see if the patient have um, simple moderate and severe pain they can be help us also in, in terms of symptom alerts to uh, like if the patient has nausea, has vomiting, uh, orientation, the, the, the community of workers can orient to the health center and if you can call at the health center level, sometimes they can call at the district. At least we have someone in the community can give us information, can identify new patient. Maybe we have patient can move from one district to another district. Maybe they're not passing by Kibagabaga, but at least we have someone in the community can give us back. We can report or so and send the report to the health center. Then the health center will send the report to, 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 to the district level. So the role also is to sensitize um, and uh, and push the population to be really, really engaged in, in it. don't wait the last minute, though like for for some cancer, there is some cancer, uh, we can prevent some cancer by, by early detection. So this is kind of uh, uh, the role we try to uh, to define by by training the community health workers. But uh, for sure the, uh, the Minister of Health is really planning a really um, curriculum for the future, um, the community workers will be really work on 
uh, on uh, chronic NCD and palliative care. So, but at least our small experiences show us that have someone in the community can really change uh, the, the whole concept uh, in uh, in uh, in the public health system, but also can give secure. Uh, for the patient and family to be sure that someone, at least we have someone in the community, at least we can ask or we can, uh, we can advise. So this is something that was really, really helpful. Um, we have also Butaro Cancer Hospital, and so in 2005, so the Rwanda Ministry of Invite PIH, uh, the Pattern in Health, to help expand health access in rural uh, Rwanda. So, and Butar was really uh, selected and inaugurated by the Minister of Health. So, and at least in Rwanda we have a place where patients can go uh, diagnosed by cancer, uh, be diagnosed um, about different cancer, and also they can have a treatment uh, using the, 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 the Using the mutual de santé, using the insurance, the community health based insurance, which is quite, uh, it's incredible. You can imagine how that reduced the cost of traveling abroad from mo most of the population, the Rwanda population. So, as you can see in 2012, uh, Honorable Minister of Health, uh, Dr. Agnes, uh, launched the, uh, the Butaro Hospital. Cancer Care of Excellence in Rwanda with the former president of the U.S., uh, the president Bill Clinton, and um, it was really, really a, a great achievement from Rwanda to have a cancer care when people can come and uh, get advice, orientation, treatment, management, and and, and even educated to be educated in. in in uh, how they can prevent cancer. So it's a really, really a great resource from Rwanda and a great achievement from the Rwanda government. So what the lesson we learn? So pain it's one of uh, the most um, challenges. So if you treat pain, so we are sure most of the patients can really uh, agree to move in the community. So morphine made difference among cancer patients. So also we treat patients in holistic approach. Holistic approach means the total care, not ignoring in our culture, and using our experiences on the field to see how we can manage patients. And and uh, also uh, it's a really cost effectiveness. So because uh, the, the patient pay ten percent, and uh, you know when you you have seventy percent of patients with chronic disease. Uh, accepted to be discharged, so you, in terms of cost at the hospital, that is, it's really, it's a huge, it's a huge gain. So uh, we, 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 we learn from that. So it's really cost effectiveness by using the mutual de santé, which is really um, uh, achieve the universal health coverage. So also work with, the, the, as a team, uh, with different partnership with the local and international. So this is the lesson we learn. Uh, the challenge um, with it's the turnover of personal training. Uh, training in palliative care for children is still a challenge. Palliative care needs for all the non-communicable disease. The curriculum of palliative care not yet integrated in school of uh, health and sciences. And um, stoicism, which is um, it's an important culture value. So uh, sometimes we have patients who cannot express their feelings and emotion. You can ask about, do you have pain? The patient can say, no, uh, not really. No, it's not really. And sometimes, you know, the family themselves, they say, oh, yo, you have a, a, what we, <laughs> we say in my, my mother tongue, a young uh, adult. That means um, you can, uh, it's like, just be be strong. Let's just be strong, and uh, uh, sometimes it's difficult too because you can give in painkiller and 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 it's weak or strong opioid, and the, even if the, it's not really reduce the pain of the patient, but the patient can say, "Oh, I'm fine. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'm fine." So uh, we have also to understand about about this uh, important culture value. Also, research. We we need to do some research. Uh, and most of recent and evidence based in palliative care. So my conclusion is uh, the conclusion from one of my mentor in in, in pain policy uh, fellowship program, uh, Le Baron Virginia. 
So she said that palliative care is not optional. It's not an extra, an add-on, a lecture of uh, afterthought. It's really an essential component of uh, human cancer care. So, uh, and this is what I really I believe. So to, if we need to develop a cancer treatment without parallel development of palliative care, it's a really a cruel injustice uh, to the million of cancer patients. So uh, I think for in every country, it's absolutely essential to, uh, to think about, when we think about uh, access to radiotherapy, uh, cervical cancer screening, chemotherapy, and all vital important, they must also be talking in a core measure and uh, in the core conviction about access to, to palliative care. Uh, so we need to think globally and act, uh, and act locally. So uh, uh, we, we can't do palliative care uh, as, as a hospital, as a, just a group. So we need to think as a team because uh, as you can see, this is my, my last uh, slide. As you can see, it's quite difficult to really focus on, uh, if we are not working at the, uh, as a team, it will be really uh, difficult to achieve. So uh, let's think globally by acting uh, locally. Uh, and uh, we have just to remember that what we are doing on the field can, can impact the the, the global and the, the experiences of Rwanda can be even duplicated for other African countries and that the experiences could be shared for even for Western country. We, we think and uh, uh, work as a team, it's really crucial uh, to really achieve um, the, the goals and improve the quality of life for, uh, for millions of patients and their family who really need uh, uh, palliative care. So thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Now, um, for those that uh, are tuning in, I'm just trying to be conscious of time. We did uh, run a little bit over, so I will, uh, I guess, make Christian available, um, hopefully for follow-up. Um, there's a few things that I wanted to highlight. So for those that have just uh, popped in and are viewing the call, uh, we have uh, Dr. Christian Nizamira from, from Rwanda. Uh, he's speaking to um, Kibagagaga. Kibaga Thank you. Thank you. In Kigali, I got that one correct. Um, yeah. and, and their selection for integration of palliative care in, uh, uh, on behalf of the government. Um, so the first thing to highlight is just uh, Christian actually published a beautiful arg uh, article that we have featured on uh, ypchronic.org, so on our website. So I encourage anyone uh, who is viewing to follow up and, and read that piece, that supplement to, to this talk. And then, Christian, I'll close with just one question for you. Um, so okay. as we are um, an advocacy or, uh, network, so YPCDN, can you tell us briefly about one to two key steps you took to improve access to pain med medicines, um, or more both within the district hospital, but more widely across uh, the country in, in Rwanda? Uh, I think it's um, uh, working with closely with uh, um, uh, the Minister of Health and uh, and we, we use the experiences of Kibagabaga to show how um, access to uh, strong opioid could really change the quality of life of uh, many of patients. As I, I said previously, we, we, we started uh, using morphine was uh, in the in the hospital was really four percent, then we moved to twenty three percent. So we move to use only morphine for uh, post op, but to use morphine for all patients who need uh, and and uh, need uh, um, pain relief, and especially those who have uh, severe pain like cancer patient. And as we we saw. Uh, 70 more than 75 percent of patients move uh, uh, from the hospital to to uh, to the community it was really a strong advocacy uh, for pain uh, uh, access control uh, and uh, so it was really it was obvious it's evidence-based without uh, uh, talking too much because the patient themselves 
they were so happy and said, why uh, this morphine was not really available early? Why we, it's quite difficult? So, and then that's changed completely the concept of uh, professionals. Um, I think you also do a, a great job of, of highlighting that piece for the importance of evidence um, uh, in, in dealing with palliative care and, and integration in the article you wrote. Um, I will actually thank you on, on behalf of the, the network and, and sign off now. For those that are looking to follow up with questions, um, please feel free to reach, us, reach out to us um, both by commenting on, on Christian's article on the blog at YP Chronic as well as through Twitter. Uh, the network's uh, handle is NCD Action, so do not hesitate. Uh, we hope that this conversation, um, being an important one, does continue. Uh, this mini-series highlights such a, such a small portion of, of such a, a, a big and, and globally important piece. So thank you, Christian, for joining us. I thank really you. appreciate thank it. You. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Excellent. And for those that uh, will be following up, we have another YP Speaks coming, um, hopefully in a bi-weekly. Uh, we are, are looking to, to source more speakers as well for the coming months. So if there's something you want to speak to, please feel free to reach out to us as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.